Welcome, everyone. I'm David Hamilton, and welcome to What If Alt His, a uh, new podcast, our, the inaugural episode of Common Ground. Today, I'm with Rudyard Lynch, the uh, founder and uh, uh, primary pr- uh, personality for What If Alt His, and Greg Guevara, our first guest. I want to say welcome, Greg. Welcome, uh, Rudyard. Glad to have you with us. Super excited to start this podcast. Dave's my co-host. Uh, we've become good friends, and he's from the America's Future series, and we're going to be running this uh, as far as I know into the future, and we're going to be bringing on interesting guests such as Greg, and um, I think you're all going to love it. Really excited. And let me tell you a bit about Greg. We've been friends for a couple of years, and he runs the JREG YouTube channel, which I think changes its name like every three weeks, and what Greg does is he makes really cool political comedy and the link to his videos are going to be in the description of this video. But I think most of you have already heard of him. Uh, I think of any YouTuber I'd pick, he's the one that has the most crossover and his big, the big series he made that was very popular is anti-centrism, which is a artistic series about these different radical factions trying to kill the centrists in centricide or genocide. But he's done lots of other cool stuff with mental health, with loneliness, with um, bizarre political ideologies. And so welcome, Greg. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. uh, I'm excited to be here as the first guest of uh, Serious Thinker series. I'm very serious and very thinkery, as we've we've mentioned. So yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. You're actually a great guest for us to have because... What Common Ground is about is trying to um, find common ground between the various political ideologies. And the fact that you make fun of them all is actually kind of perfect. Um, I re- jokingly refer to myself as a radical centrist or a radical moderate, if there was such a thing. And one of my friend's mentors that helped us start America's Future Series was Ross Perot Jr. And for those of you who don't know Ross Perot Jr., he ran for president. He was a, a Texas a billionaire, started EDS, Pro Wait, Systems, you met et cetera. Ross Perot? Yeah, Ross Pro uh, Senior. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, we started with Ross Pro Senior and T Boone Pickens and other folks like that helped us get our start with America's Future Series, our speaker t- series and think tank. And he is probably one of the most notable radical moderates, radical centrists. You know, he proposed a um, balanced budget amendment and term limits and things like that, et cetera, and sort of pro-American um, trade policy and things like that. So, um, so I jokingly refer to myself as a radical or hardcore centrist. You know, and um, and our our speaker series is radically nonpartisan. Is, is um, radically nonpartisan. So having someone like Greg who makes fun of everybody is sort of music to my ears. I, I love your podcast, etc. I'm your newest biggest fan, and I just want to say you know, thanks for coming. Of course, thanks for having me. Common ground so important. Centrism extremely important. My uh, my current name is actually Jay Regular because I'm um, I I used to be a you know a more radical person, uh, but, but now you're to- you're a hardcore regular guy. Hardcore regular, uh, maybe even a radical regularist. Radical um, regular. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think a lot of people don't make arguments for the status quo. We make arguments against it. And uh, I think I think there's a lot there's a lot to be liked about it, but not too much because that would be that would be too extreme. So moderation right. in all things is immoderate is a quote. Moder- That's what yeah, mo- model said. Right. Moderation in all things except moderation. Right. Um, Aristotle. Too meta. Arist- too Aristotle said that you should achieve the golden mean or the moderate of all things. And thus you should be even moderate in your moderation, allowing you to be radical at times. Right. And yeah, at the I same mean, time, we're told all the time we have to be reasonable, but so, there's something called Busey's law, which is nothing of importance was accomplished by a reasonable man, some variation on that. So we're always told we have to be reasonable, but if we're reasonable, we kind of get pushed over a little bit, right? So are we really hardcore reasonable? And a question I'd throw out is I often think of um, my father's a huge fan of the Mad Max movie. So I saw all of them as a child on repeat. And there's this line in the second Mad Max movie. And it's for those that don't know, it's set in post-apocalyptic Australia. And they there's this warlord called the Humongous who wears this like serial killer mask and he's besieging the town. And what they the town people say Let's talk to this humongous. He's a reasonable man. But the thing is, in a post-apocalyptic Australia, being a centrist is being a horrifying warlord who's trying to genocide everyone because that's how much the Overton windows changed. Mm-hmm. All definitional. <laughs> bit of a, a bit of a, the paradox of centrism is yeah. it's triangulated between two other points. 
So it, it, it doesn't, uh, you know, the criticism of the non-radical kind of centrism, which is where we're all the, we're all the good kind of centrism here is, uh, that you will do not have an actual political position because you're just dancing, you know, the Overton window moves left, you yeah. shuffle to the left, it moves right, you shuffle to the right. Um, and that's, that's, you could say that's the majority of people before they become politically conscious or literate or aware. Yeah. Um, what's the your view really right? interests me because, um, most young people I meet, especially the more successful, um, intelligent, um, productive ones are disaffected. They're not very happy with the status quo. They're not happy with the current setup. They're not happy with how, um, uh, there's just continuous infighting that we're tearing each other apart. And so they've kind of stepped back and said, I don't think I really want to be political at all. I don't want to belong to any of these things. They've kind of become isolationists in their own lives a little bit. So how does that play for you guys? Is that, is, is that kind of where you feel you're at? Is that, does that resonate? That's called the black pill. That's what we call the black pill in politics. Gotcha. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, extremists get, you know, black pilled because they uh, try to make political change happen. They get burned out. They get isolated from society. And uh, I say good riddance. Get rid of them and hope. And, and then they burn out and then they become good old members of the status quo. And I love the status quo. So I'm a big fan of that. And when you say the status quo, you, you know, in all seriousness, what, what kind of elements, what, what highlights, what, what would be examples of things that uh, you value that are traditional, if you want to call it that, or status quo? Uh, I used to have a pretty uh, coherent definition of the status quo. And then I decided I just wanted to fit in. And ever since I decided that, I decided I'll just do what everyone else is doing. So I don't, I try not to think about it too much. The more, the more I think about it, the, the more pain it brings me. What we're getting at here is like people who are involved with politics burn out because it's not a good game to play. Uh, it's actually much better just to keep your head down, keep your keep yourself in, in the in the cave, in the Plato's cave. And uh, I'm I've decided to boldly stay in the cave. Good for you. Do you know? Um, um, go ahead. Do you know uh, the the social justice NPC meme? Because that just reminded me of that. There's this whole meme online that right wingers make that basically there's. These, there's the left. There's an establishment left wing media, and the people beneath that just immediately switch to whatever position. And I think, yeah, I, I, I know, I know the meme you're talking about. I yeah, think reasonably that both right wingers and left wingers do that, and that's a real problem. Where there's there's the opposite end of that meme, right? Where it's a I don't like current thing, and it's just all the you know right wing talking points. Yeah. A good good centrist meme, I say, when you have the two of them in communication with each other. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So being part of the cool kid club, as I call it, seems to be the key um, focus. Like you said, being you want to be popular, you don't want to get in trouble, so you're going to go it's along with whatever the group is. It's much easier. Yeah. Um, I don't have to think. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I don't want to have a nuanced conversation because that actually makes me really think. You know, I, I couldn't kind of agree with you on some things and maybe differ a little bit. I I really need to swallow the entire pill uh, because if I don't, then I can make you unpopular. And you and. and Rudyard does a great job of this, of looking back at every civilization and how they grow and fall and all this kind of stuff. And the one that I think fits this pretty well is the uh, French Revolution. And I like to say that the guillotine is always thirsty. I mean, if you're not hardcore revolutionary enough, once they killed all of the rich people, all the aristocrats, the guillotine was still around. They still had it to use. So they said, well, you're not quite with us, so we're going to go ahead and kill you too. So you really have to be a zealot. And there seems to be an arm race to be more zealot than the other. And to try to find new ways to, to virtue signal more than the other person so that you can be the coolest kid in the cool kid club. Yeah. The True. Guillotine, the guillotine's always thirsty is my new Tinder profile. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I would say that's probably uh, partially an effect of the Internet. Uh, the sort of rhetorical inflation that you see online. Um, if somebody says, you know, something that's like, I don't know, eight points to the right, and then someone else comes in with something that's 10 points to the right, then it's like, oh, based, based, because uh, uh, they're making a more extreme case. And it just, it's, it, it feels you good. Right? Yeah. One yeah. of the things that I'm kind of scared about is on being a political figure more so on the right is I see this radicalization happen in real time. And we're at the point where I'll say, like, I like the Jews. And then I'll get a hundred replies on Twitter being like, you're a fucking white traitor. Or I'll say, like, burning witches is bad. And then I'll get a bunch of comments that are saying, like, like, how can you believe that? And I've just seen the Overton window, like, shift four degrees to the right over the last three years. 
Mm-hmm. So, so I don't know if you guys know this, you don't know this, Greg, but I spent a long time in the civil rights movement and consider myself a classic liberal. I consider myself a classic liberal in the vein of, say, a Bill Maher, even though I'm not nearly as funny or as rich or as caustic. Um, and like Bill Maher, you know, you see Bill Maher making points now, monologues, et cetera, saying, wait, 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 wait. Uh, I didn't change. You guys changed. This has gotten way too si- crazy for me. Um, you know, I, 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 may, I may not like people, uh, some principles on the, on the right, et cetera, and, I, and I'll give them hell. But you guys have gone too far. This whole Overton window thing has shifted so far that even a Bill Maher, people like Jordan Peter, Peterson probably considered themselves in their entire lives classic liberals. You know, so did Dave Rubin. And now they're all considered yeah. apostates and evil and they must die. Right. So uh, for me, um, I don't think I changed. I don't think there's any key principle that has changed for me since my 20s and 30s. And I'm in my 60s. So none of that has changed. But my country certainly has changed. And the attitudes have changed. And the fact that we can't even ha- we can't have a civil discourse is is the, the willingness to counsel people, the desire to the 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 discipline of making all buying decisions based on somebody's politics is stunning to me. I, I actually know people said, well, I look at everything I buy and I only buy if they align with my politics. So welcome to that world. We, we brought you this world. Sorry. Um, Rudyard is a whole thing on how the baby boomers screwed up the world. It's a really great video. People should Thank watch you. it. Mea culpa. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe you guys can fix it. I... <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah we'll we'll we'll, we'll yeah, take care of this we'll yeah. take care of that yeah um Bet- between lattes and 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 influencing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. no i couldn't agree more i i agree with everything you said okay Not well great i don't know where we go from here you know what the common ground the reason we're having this is we want to bring people on and have actual substance of discussions mm-hmm. pick particular topics Every time I've sat down with somebody who considers himself left or right, and we say, I'm not going to call myself left or right, let's just pick a topic and let's work a problem. Let's come up with a scheme or a, an approach, even if it's, say, um, uh, immigration. We could say, okay, well, what's the total number of people that should be able to come into America? You know, let's start with that. Do we want absolute open borders or is there a limit? And if you go through each of those elements, and you actually write it down, you can actually come up with an approach at the end of the day, as long as you don't say, I'm right and you're left, I'm right and you're wrong. Um, on most issues, you can come up with a reasonable accommodation, right? Except for a few people. And then when it gets to the point where they're so, I mean, it, it, uh, let's just pick, take this point. I am against complete and utter open borders. I think there is an upper limit on the total number of human beings America can take into it onto its shores. There are people though that don't agree with me. And I don't know how to have a conversation with that person. But if we do conceptually believe in the idea that there is an upper limit to the total number of people America can absorb successfully, whether they're skilled, unskilled, whatever, if we agree to that, then we could probably come to an accommodation, right? I do think there's something to be said about finding infrastructure for people who disagree to have conversations. And I think, I think we are figuring that out slowly. Um, I, I think, I think it's a, uh, we, we simultaneously are getting stronger and stronger echo chambers. If you want to stay in an echo chamber, but you can also go outside your echo chamber, find, find people debating. And, you know, sometimes those debates are all about just power and looking better, but uh, you know, it, it, it happens. And I, I think, I think we will figure it out as time goes on um, and we'll all come together and we'll hug. And, yeah. and you'll have comedy again. You could go to a comedy club, right? And, and, and we could have a little bit of biting comedy and the place won't erupt. Yeah, it's a shame. Comedy is dead. Comedy, comedy died. Comedy died. Comedy died. Peace. comedy died. Anyway. Um, how did you, Greg, how did you get into anti-centrism? Well, you know, I was, uh, I was looking online and I, I thought, what, 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 what would be the most popular position? Because uh, centrism didn't seem very popular. I looked up centrism. Everyone was complaining about that. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, if everyone doesn't like centrist, then I'll just identify as an anti-centrist and then everyone will love me. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's 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 the game. But now I've, I've come to my senses. I've realized centrism is the way to go. Only only being in the middle now. For example, here's how I deal with the immigration debate. I, uh, I take the two most extreme people, for example, uh, one person who wants open borders and a white nationalist that wants an ethno state. And I, I pick a good compromise between them. And I say, mm, you know, maybe 50% of the people 
are uh, are uh, are the ethnic majority, and the other fifty percent open borders. I don't know, something like that. You gotta you gotta find a compromise like that, and I, I think that really pushes thought forward. Uh, um, just to change the topic, Greg, you have one of the most insane—I mean, insane positive fan communities I've ever seen. Like your fans are insanely active at like making stuff creating parodies and like their own versions of the material you make. And so I just want to compliment you on that. Yeah, thanks. That was, uh, I, I like to see like fan art for my fans, uh, fan projects. There was, uh, there was, there's a lot of, you know, people adding to the lore that I, that I, um, set out and it, it sort of, uh, adds a little bit to the, uh, spectacle of, of, of politics and kind of the, um, the level removed of political ideologies and stuff from yeah. like actual political world. Like it becomes like a fan fiction or a, or a exactly. lore or like anything else. And uh, that's what politics is anyway. So it's just, I mean, one of the points I find really interesting for you is you've established these really cool character archetypes of like my favorites, the commie. I know for people on the left, their favorite is the ANCAP, but they're, they're really funny. But the thing is, these are political positions from raw reality from a hundred years ago. There aren't, Except for like Xi Jinping, he's trying to do it, but there's no one who's like an active Stalinist Marxist anymore. There's no one who's like a legit, there are very few like actual fascists. And it's one of the things I've found is an online culture, people take these political positions from very long ago, then they make them into memes. And if you're right, it's like Harry Potter, it's like Lord of the Rings. And they like, like, I'm going to dress up as an ANCAP for Halloween. And mm -hmm. one of the questions, I mean, I have two things I'll throw at you. The first is, what do you like and dislike of the political spectrum? And do you think we're going to establish wholly new ideologies in the future that are separate from the current political spectrum? Uh, I think, yeah. So what do I like and dislike about the political spectrum? Uh, well, like a one-dimensional political spectrum, uh, I would say is probably, it's, it's, it's obviously too limiting. You know, you yeah. want to... Like I, for all the faults a political compass has, one of the great things that it's done is make people think about politics in more than one yeah. uh, dimension. Um, and then, do I think there will be different politics that is created? I I think with stuff like um, you can see this in like people running their Discord servers. It's going to be like there's going to be metaverse worlds with different rules and different uh, governmental structures. And I think uh, I think that's probably going to be the place where you see the most amount of political variety. And you might even see like, could you do like a virtual test of UBI in like an area online and see if it like will function real world in the real world? So, I mean, there, there's a lot of interesting things to think about. But because I'm a centrist, I must say, no, the one dimensional line is good. And there will be no political ideologies besides the left and the right. That's that's all there is. That's all there ever will be. Have you seen uh, the political triangle? It's something that I think my friend Kurt Doolittle invented. I don't know if he was the original person, but it's communism. It's based on the three economic systems you have. It's equality, communism, one part, liberty, another part, authority, another part. And so all societies were to be somewhere in that triangle. That sounds familiar. Uh, are you sure it's, I remember it being like fascism, uh, like state communism yeah, and like anarchy. Right. right. Yeah, it's, um, it, those are the three pillars, but those are symbols for what they, um, what the underlying concepts are. Have Have you seen that that triangle, David? Because I th I feel like that might be uh, something that you you would find um, interesting. Well, I find it interesting because Rudyard and I and uh, some of his friends have had a conversation about sort of a new society, a new approach, a new ideology. Uh, I'm not sure what to call it, but. Um, it seems that there is a yearning and need for uh, something other than the left-right paradigm, other than the Republican conservative thing. Ross Perot Sr., who I told you about, he started his own party back in the day, and it wasn't the Tea Party. And he wrote a book, America, um, what was it? It was a, uh, something about America Divided or whatever. Um, uh, and he tried to start a centrist sort of libertarian movement, a new party uh, that where people could agree on certain principles and, and there were things like, hey, self-reliance is a good thing. Um, but 
there should be a social uh, uh, safety net, that the government should take care of those who can't take care of themselves, and that we need a strong military, yet we want to avoid war. We, you know, he was a bit of a, uh, an isolationist in terms of those, those things. So I think there are some key principles that fit within this triangle of, okay, how much equality do we want? How much uh, authority do we want to give? How much freedom, et cetera? Where does that fit? And none of the current solutions that we have right now seem to appeal to this 2030 something intelligentsia, high potential, disaffected, mostly white male group, right? Who don't like the dating world. They don't like how they're treated with in the job market. They don't like how they're treated in, um, uh, in, in, in relationships, et cetera, right? Uh, religion is, is a problem. There's, there, there's no belonging. There's no sense of, uh, of a sort of a church community type thing. America has become completely non-religious uh, and therefore they're looking for something to belong to well, what is that? And where am I treated? And where am I treated? Uh, wh where, where do I feel at home? And I don't think there's a good place. And that's why five, six, seven percent of our population, mostly white young males, dropped out of the workforce. Wow. I mean, they, they just decided five percent of the workforce is just uh, gainfully unemployed. Uh, and that's a brand new thing. And some of it has to do with society. I think it's not just that we had COVID. It's screw this. I'm not wanted. Um, and, and most of these, 60-something uh, percent of those people are, are male. They're white males. Well, we're losing their contribution to our society. So there has to be something out of this. Um, uh, something has to come out of this that is a new approach and a new way of belonging to re-engage those people so that they feel like they're part of society. Also, League of Legends is very fun. Uh so that's that that probably plays into it. No, you're uh, I mean, you're, what you're getting at is like the the atomization, lack of community, um, sort of people don't feel a part of something bigger. They don't have a motivation to leave their house or their cube or whatever. Um, and should there be a reason to leave your cube? I don't know. My cube's pretty comfy. Um, uh, well, OK, this gets back to what I call affluenza. We are wealthy enough and safe enough to be able to stare at our navel and just idle you know get idly by right oh yeah and we're surrounded by water on both sides the toughest enemy we have are the canadians a and everybody loves the canadians right um everybody out the south wants to come here so we don't deal with real world problems very often and this enables us to check out and stay in my cube and not really participate because i don't have to yeah, I mean, that we had communities because we had to have communities. And if you don't need communities, then you'll have less communities. Um, yeah. And so, and Rudy and I are both fans of this thing called the Mouse Utopia. Have you seen this Mouse Utopia? Yeah, thing? someone uh, that last call, Greg. Someone sent, uh, I remember someone sent me that Mouse Utopia uh, study yeah. and I, I read it. It sounds, yeah, not enough. There's a great problem. video on YouTube. And, you know, the key point is that every time they run the experiment, with no threat, with no problems, with unlimited food and plenty of uh, habitat, the mouse population goes to whatever, goes straight up, and then it crashes, and every time it goes to zero. Mm -hmm. And you get this fractionated, weird societies. You get the pretty ones who preen themselves all the time and you know, suck up to the dominant also males who don't want to have babies. They're a, they're we're, a we're just, top band. Ah, <laughs> yes. They're a Korean they're... top band. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's uh it's it's just like it's just like modern world the Greg, uh um, the, the, the mice some yeah. of greg's yeah. latest projects have been on mental health and loneliness and what have you found in doing all that uh well you know uh i started getting interested in 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 loneliness well so you know i talk about politics i talk about mental health i talk about loneliness seems like unrelated topics but they're actually all pretty oh, intricately okay. linked I mean, we like when we were talking earlier about like um, people, political extremists, people getting blackpilled, um, you know, the mental health component is a part of that. How can we help people engage with politics sustainably in a way that doesn't burn them out, in a way that doesn't make them feel like they can't express their opinions or if, if they, that there's not, not even any point of like expressing your opinion or, or, or even like if you get really blackpilled, like you don't even want to vote or you don't want to participate in the political process at all. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's the same, it's the same conversation that we're having just a little, we're, we're shifting the, the frame a little. Um, and uh, yeah, so with loneliness, I, I think what I've noticed is like a lot of people are so lonely, but they don't know it. They are not aware of what they're lacking. Uh, you know, getting, um, getting a few valuable relationships in my life made me realize how many more that I was missing. 
And I think a lot of people are in that situation. When I talk to them, people say, you know, I ask people like, what's your community? And they say, um, oh, I've got my friend and I've got my other friend. I'm like, no, nah, no, that doesn't, that's not a community. A community is a broader place where you can pull friends into a smaller circle of closer friends. Um, but it's not like, it's not just you, the three guys you hang out with. That's not a community. It has to be, you know, it can be a music community or church community. Like we were saying that that was a, a you know, a popular form of community. Now we have to figure out something different. And it's not, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a sign that we're like, community blackpilled and we're never going to figure anything out, else out. But it is a sign that like right now we need to be aware of our need for other people. And it's complicated because we have a need for other people, but we don't need other people. Like we, we do physiologically need important relationships in our lives, but we can also live just staying in our cube and looking at our computer. Yeah. I mean, I think, yes. I think me and like guys, me and Greg's age or people, me and Greg's age have really been screwed over. And it's crazy. Like my dad's Dave, Dave's age. And I would ask my dad as a child, like what society was like. And he said, yeah, like me and my buddies, we just meet up after school every day and play baseball, like with no coordination or um, like there were large church communities or bowling communities or whatever you want to say. And my experience of high school and much, much of the Gen Z experience and when I went to college briefly is just exactly stay in your cube and play League of Legends. And it's, I mean, I feel like in, in my high school, it, everyone was either a workaholic or a degenerate. And <laughs> that it was seems very kid. bifurcated. Almost yeah. all these topics seem bifurcated, right? So you either belong to some identity where you identify yourself as a social justice warrior, yeah. right? Um, I'm a black American, I'm a Latino American, whatever, or I'm an atomized, I'm off all by myself and I, and I just hang out with my three friends, like you described, Greg, right? So there's a group that seems to feel like they have a big, that they, they have a big society or big pool to draw from, that they belong to something and they have a very strong identity and their culture, their whatever, and, and you'll hear them talk about that all the time. But then this disaffected group that I worry about is, doesn't seem, I don't know if that's the right word, but they're disenchanted, disconnected. Disaffected is the right word. Okay, I mean, and, and, and isolated. If it didn't and, come uh, with a bunch of connotations, sorry to cut you off, Dave, but if it didn't- No, go, no, bunch, go ahead. If it didn't come with a bunch of connotations, I'd say incel, because the incels are a great example of that, but also no one wants to be called an incel. And- kind of rightly they've been mocked into not being serious and the incels in my opinion come from a really big problem but they're not really serious in of themselves yeah the uh the the incels you know they gotta rise up that's what i say what no i'm just kidding about, you made a video at incels being like sexual communism where the yeah they're the proletariat of sex yeah and yeah. so you need we like we need to to divide sex up there, and there's a top one percent of chad slay over 50 percent of the uh it's a real problem yeah. um yeah the Inca did that so in my youth we studied certain people there were certain people we were devotees of followers etc in particular mine was saul alinsky i don't know if either yeah i know um yeah, I read Roger knows a little bit about saul alinsky uh but he wrote the book rules for radicals and it was the notion of how to yeah, have okay how to have um uh, disproportionate power as a it's sort of asymmetric warfare lessons we learned out of Vietnam how the Vietnam how the Vietnamese beat us because they were a smaller less powerful force and yet they made it so painful for us we decided to leave right so they sort of fought above their weight class and certain people in the civil rights movement you know use these principles and uh, the most famous of course was the book rules for radicals with the 13 rules and um, one of Alinsky's points was that you use um, tech tactics that your group will accept that they like and you always want to use the tactic that they will to protest to get power whatever and um right now there seems to be some people that will rise up and they will burn a building down they will take over a city they are serious hardcore that's more more like say the vietnamese right vietnamese were willing to live in a cave and eat rat to get the americans and the french to leave okay they they didn't play right but then the great middle the centrist group etc i mean the closest thing might they might do is let me not pay their taxes until after J april 15th you know okay i'll make that july 4th that, that's gonna be my protest that's about as hardcore as i can get or i might block traffic but if i block traffic i would stop myself from going to work and paying taxes right so they would they would be protesting against themselves right so one group is really hardcore uh, uh, and serious 
The other has just checked out. And so in most things, a, a, a small minority has great power. If six, seven, eight percent of a group decides to get active and take over, if you look at a flock of birds, it only takes six or seven percent of the flock of birds for, uh, to go one direction and the rest of the flock goes with them, just like a school of fish. For your generation, for guys like you, and you guys are influencers, you talk to a lot of people. Um, I mean, if they were to get politically active, um, what would they do? It seems to me that the most you can ask them to do is vote. That's about... You could get a revolution going. I think it would be pretty easy to launch a revolution today. I mean... I, I, yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. Uh, I think that you posed a very good question, and it's a very relevant question. I'll let you, I'll let you continue that, right, dude? Oh, yeah. I mean, it would be easy to coordinate a revolution. You just do it through... Um, you use Reddit to radicalize people, then you would do it through um, like various networks like Signal. The internet allows such mass coordination that you could probably pull it off pretty easily. And there are so many disaffected young people who are just looking, they're bored out of their minds. <laughs> but but would, would, they, would they be radicals for centrism? Would they be radical for sanity, for common sense? I mean, for... no, you can't, launch a, you can't launch a centrist revolution. That goes without saying. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's an oxymoron. Um, my my worldview depends on everything now remaining the same as it always has been. So I think it, it, it remains to be seen, actually, if these people will actually be political radicals or if they're just all talk on Twitter. Um, it's very possible that the opportunity for radicalism will you know rear its head, but everyone's too busy being in their cube and being atomized to actually do anything about it, which is good because then there won't be a revolution. Yeah, you know, um, do you remember um, Dynetics? Um, what was his name? L. Ron Hubbard. He wrote a number of science fiction books. And in one of his science fiction books, there was a department of sabotage. And the department of sabotage's job was to just make sure the government didn't do anything. So it's been it, it's an entire department of the government intended to keep the government from doing anything. So apathy and not doing anything was the goal. So apparently we've got that built in. This new culture already has that. We don't need the Department of um, Sabotage. We just, you know, that's just kind of the way it is. In Canada, we call that Ottawa. Ottawa. There you go. One of They have the Department of Sabotage. Get nothing done. Push paper. Talk about doing things. Yeah, but but Ottawa. but uh, but we've 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 built that into our, uh, our our political system. So it's just a black pill machine, and I I, I you know that's if that's how it's got to be to to keep things the same. Then that's how it's got to be. Well, one of the goals that we want to have out of this program is to come up with things that people can do that might be positive. You know, something to because it feels a little bit like you're a mouse on a treadmill and you're not getting anywhere, right? And I think people need a wheel. They need to feel like you know, hey, I need to be able to move something forward, et cetera. And uh, I think they need a forum for a to vent to voice this kind of disaffection etc but then also come rally around something which is hey the current systems don't work very well and we'll listen to a these kind of people listen to a russell brand right they'll listen to a joe rogan etc right and they'll say the current system is working but we don't have a good definition of what that ought to be mm -hmm. what, what 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 does it morph into what what how do we change how do we change politics etc how do we get cronyism out how do we you know People want to drain the swamp. Great. Well, the alligators don't like it when you drain the swamp. Mm -hmm. You know, they live there. I'll use right? that. And they have teeth. So I think there's a, a, a your your generation is going to be the one that figures out something new. But I'm just haven't figured out what the rallying cry or the rallying point or maybe the personality is, is going to be or the set of principles are going to be um, that creates this new normal, this new, hey, you guys are the far, far left are insane. You guys are the far, far right are insane. Um, we need something practical that works for us that isn't too draconian. It doesn't have too much, you know, and that triangle doesn't have too much authority where we are democratic. And yet you don't really want everybody voting on everything all at once, right? Can you imagine if Twitter was our voting mechanism? I read a sci-fi book that we talked do. about that. It was nuts. <laughs> yeah. There's an entire I, because we're into, class where it's their hobby to always vote on every single issue. And so you have this degenerate group of people who stay in their rooms all day and vote on every single issue on their version of Twitter. And they disproportionately run politics. That, that's what we call e-direct democracy, uh, where you, you log on to Twitter and if someone pays you $500 to vote a certain way and you, you do that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's feasible hypothetically, but you'd have to like have some sort of strict guidelines in place. I think what you're describing is like... Uh, we're we're in a state where we can like it's I think 
we have a lot of people uh, in politics who immediately jump to a conclusion. Um, so it makes it a little harder to analyze the problem. Um, cause when you go straight to the conclusion, then you're not necessarily, you're not hundred percent sure about have we identified the problem properly. You haven't really wrestled with it. Yeah. I mean, with the topic of atomization, like I can pretty clearly and, and succinctly see, okay, yeah, that's a problem. You know, people not having meaningful relationships. So they end up, you know, maybe you get like a partner, maybe you get a girlfriend and that's your whole life. You just stay in a cube with your girlfriend and that's it. Um, but when it comes to suggesting something specific for how to solve that problem, that's a much harder question to answer. Um, and it's it's so hard that, and I, I feel like it's something that I, I, I almost have less interest in because it is so hard. And I know that I would be talking, you know, out of nowhere if I try to give an answer to that. But uh, well, I like the fact that you're doing this. I, I like the fact that you're bringing up loneliness uh, and, and these kinds of subjects, et cetera, because it leads to better mental health. I mean, we need a, a, a admit the problem, admit that it's real, make other people feel like, hey, you're not alone. Other people feel this way, too. Um, mm -hmm. Find some sort of discourse. So I, I have one kind of question for you, though, uh, pertaining to that, which is where do you see yourself in a couple of years where do you see your, your your satire, your comedy, your commentary, your focus? Where do you see that going in the next few years? I mean, I, I went all the way back and watched your valedictorian speech, which was really good, by the way. People should go back and all the way and go back and see that. So, so there's been an evolution in what, what you've done, what you focus on. Where's that going? Do you have any sense of it? Or are you just kind of uh, taking it moment by moment? Yeah, I mean, I typically just talk about whatever interests me at the moment. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I didn't exactly plan to, you know, talk about loneliness at the time that I did. It just sort of became a fixation of mine. And I was reading a book about it and I thought, OK, well, now I'm hyper interested in this and I want to make I might want to make uh, art about it. Um, for example, like, you know, it might start off with me doing something like studying incels. And then, uh, you know, I think about, OK, well, what's making the incels incels, right? What are what are some of the underlying problems beyond just, you know, calling them bad men or whatever, stupid. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, you can go from that to like thinking about loneliness as in a broader term and thinking about how it affects people besides incels, like how it affects everybody else, how it affects, you know, how it affects young men or even women or, you know, older people like my like grandparents like should have a community. Um, like there are a lot of older people. I know my mom, for example, she would have loved to have like kids to take care of in the, in the intermediary between her kids leaving and, um, having grandkids and stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean the infrastructure for that definitely needs to be built. I don't think it's uh, impossible to do that though. Sorry, I, for I forgot the question. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. So, um, you know, the loneliest of this thing, I, I had a friend, he was a military veteran, he was a combat vet, um, a pilot, and a White House fellow, um, just a really brilliant guy, really fit and young, you know, young looking. I, 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 because he was a lieutenant colonel, I knew he had to be in his 40s, but he looked like he was 25 or something like that, right? And everybody loved this guy. And he did a, a TED Talk on loneliness, which he sent me, he sent me this TED Talk, but I never saw it. Mm -hmm. He just said, I just took it as, oh, I did a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about the topic that he was right, you know, that he was speaking on, and it was about loneliness. Mm. And unfortunately, right after we did a, an event for Twenty Two Kill, he killed himself, mm -hmm. and he left five boys and you know and, and a wife, et cetera. Uh, and he was this amazing guy. He was the last guy you would ever think would take his own life, right? And he had so much going for him. He was such you know he, he lit up a room. He was you know he was just you know everybody loved this guy. Uh, but there was this telltale sign he had done a TED talk specifically mm -hmm. on, uh, on loneliness and I never watched it. And mm -hmm. I think if I'd actually watched it and taken it more than, Oh, I, him just saying, Hey, here's something cool. Cause you know, I have a speaker series and I was going to have him speak. I didn't stop down and think, well, what, why did this guy do a thing on loneliness? And I think I, I wish I had, and, and a lot of people felt that they should have seen signs, et cetera. But, um, you know, yeah. you know, he he was sort of the last guy you would think. So this is a big issue, and um, I think um, it's worse today than it was in my youth. I mean, first off, bullying was common. This is why I became a boxer. I got my ass kicked all the time, right? So and went to eleven schools, but I kind of get to tenth grade. So there's a lot of things that got better than they were in the past. But this loneliness, this isolation, and not feeling fulfilled and being uh, unhappy, even though we're materialistically way better off. You know, sure um, if, if unhappiness person, is, go ahead. Your average person is materially much worse off than your youth. 
Like um, most young people I know are, they often work like six days a week. They're barely paying their bills, all that sort of thing. I think it's a well, big, well, let's keep the, let's keep the boomer bullying to a minimum here. Okay. We, we... <laughs> well, that, that is a relatively new thing in the past five or six years. 10, 12 years ago, this wasn't true. You were way better off 10 years ago than you were 40 years ago. Uh, it depends right? if, if you're in the upper middle to, class, to... that's true. For everyone beneath that, because yeah. wages for the top 20% went up significantly. And it might be different for you in Texas because that was one of the biggest growth states. Um, but for like normal person in Pennsylvania. So I, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Okay. Uh, an adult in the 80s, the late 70s, 80s, um, the time it took to buy something, say a TV, yeah. the number of hours worked to buy that were far more than it was 30 years later, okay? But now at the end of this time, now we had a time where uh, everything costs way more, inflation is higher. You've pointed out that when women entered the workforce, that doubled the size of the workforce and therefore increased the supply, which you know, there's only so much demand and therefore wages went down. So you guys live in an age where you are not necessarily. And so I, I, I do stand a little corrected that in the past five, 10 years, you guys are worse off than you were. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, these are first world problems in the grand scheme of the things. If you live in America, you still won the lottery. We have drinkable bath water as opposed to having to go a half mile to go get your water. So in the grand scheme, but we are so desperately unhappy with our lot in life that it seems incongruous that we should be happier than we are, yeah. but that has to do with unmet expectations. Mm -hmm. We expected to be the Cardassians, right? We expect to be a influencer or a YouTuber or whatever, and live this life of Riley. And when we don't, we're completely despondent. And yeah. um, um, like there is a hierarchy, you know, in our minds. And when we go online, we add people to that hierarchy, even though we don't know them. You know, is it healthy for a young man to have, you know, Andrew Tate as the top dog? Is it healthy for a young woman to have a like, a, you know, a very attractive woman using like a facial, uh, you know, feature makeup thing that like changes her dimensions and you don't even know what she actually looks like? Is that healthy for that to be in the young woman's hierarchy? Uh, the answer is I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I mean, the thing is also we're immediately seeing unfair realities, because if you were in a previous era, if you knew someone you often knew the intricacies of their lives. And I briefly ran a social club in LA and a lot of the people that other people idolize don't really live good lives. I've met a good amount of like Instagram models and TikTok models, and I would not change my life for theirs. I do not envy them at all. Um, or there's like a lot of very wealthy people have severe issues going on in their life. And so if you get the full context on people's lives, you wouldn't envy them as much, but also that's not happening. People, you're getting the whitewash perfect version. Yeah, there was an interesting set of studies on nuns and their happiness level. These were aesthetic nuns who lived in monasteries, et cetera, nunneries, and lived very simple Spartan lives, simple food, a few belongings, et cetera, meditated a lot, worked all the time, et cetera, lived to be 90, 100, and they were incredibly fulfilled. Yeah. Right? They, they're very happy in their lives, et cetera, whereas... You know, this is a common thing. I, I didn't certainly we didn't invent this. This is a common thing. People know forever. money doesn't buy happiness, but it, it sure makes you more comfortable while you're being unhappy. Right. Um, so uh, I don't know what the answer for that. That is an age old thing, but it seems to be worse today. And there are systems in place today, um, situations, the, the dynamics the worst, that make it that tend to make young people in particular less happy than you would think they would be given their lot in life. I wonder what you think about that. I say cheer up. Cheer up. Cheer Buck up, up, buddy. Tongues, they, There's no crying in baseball. The thing about that triangle I just realized is uh, it, it's like the political compass, but they cut out lib left. They just lib left doesn't exist. Like if you look yeah, at well, that, that's world, the premise behind that triangle. Find me a single lib left society ever. And I, I'd also like to say that I, I put myself right in the middle of that triangle. Uh they, the the lib leftists would probably say Catalonia and Spain. Yeah, they can pick like a single enclave of 50 people in Spain. But the thing is, any other record, they would have gotten any bigger. They would have just become communists and started shooting people. Even that enclave of 50 people was run by a commissar in all terms. And They just needed to read uh, the bread book more, I think. And you can like you can look at some tribe in the Amazon or like some Israeli kibbutzes, and they're actually super right wing because they – build their entire lives off tradition. Hmm. 
Right. So it's more anarcho fascism. Okay. I'll write that one down. One of my, uh, I have two things I want to run past you, Greg. The first is I really love your episode. Uh, your two favorite episodes of mine are the, the bizarre, wacky ideologies like Positism, which is we need to like, is that the one we need to nuke the whole world? Or is that the one we need to reach out to aliens for communism? A uh, bit of both. bit of both. Yeah. They, they're, so, they're UFOologists. They're pro-nuclear war. So, Dave, Greg made this sick video about bizarre, wacky political ideologies that actually exist. One's Positism, which is you have to, it's communism, but you have to reach out to aliens to help you become communist. And also, if you nuke the world, we can restart. I can get behind that. There's, um, that works for me. There's homo nationalism, which is like you're, which is like you're gay, but also you're a Nazi, which kind of makes sense okay. because once you many get such nationalist. cases, yeah, once you get nationalist enough, everything comes full circle. Once you get national yep. enough, it's easy enough to get gay. <laughs> um, and so that was one of your favorite videos, one of your favorite videos I've seen. And the other one is your anarcho primitivist video, which I think is like hilarious because anar Dave, anarcho primitivists are people who. They're anarchists who want to blow up technology and then restart and go back to the Stone Age hunter gatherer era. Using narc, using drugs to do it. I don't... A, a narco, a narc, like anarchy. Anarch, okay, yeah, not, anarchy. Not a narcism, yeah. not a fentanyl group that wants to no, go back. No, that that's just what I do on the weekends. <laughs> okay, the narco uh, narco primitivists. That's yeah. that's a big yeah. that's a big group. Um, I think I think though the like these wacky ideologies they're like old you know in the same way that like say Stalinism might be like an old ideology you've said that not a lot of people are real Stalinists um, and so like it's just like well if we can revive Stalinism we can re revive this esoteric Posadist guy I right guess. whatever can proliferate via meme will succeed as a political ideology at least in theory now the question is will that manifest in the real world it's actually kind uh, of true. Posadism was created in the time of, uh, you know, the Cold War. And so there was the looming threat of nuclear destruction. And they were the only ones based enough to say, OK, um, but, you know, because, you know, because from the leftist perspective, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. So they say, OK, <laughs> I'll take the, that. One of the videos. I so I end up speaking on Ukraine and Russia a lot. And it's, it's an area of interest for me, et cetera. And um, it, it's interesting to me that, that, that people are so flippant about the prospect of nuclear war of pushing Putin into a corner, um, which I'm all for, and I've been really hawkish about use every single sanction you can to beat the guy up with, but then understand that if you put a bear into a corner, he might claw you, and he, this one has nukes, right? So you might want to give the bear an out, and we keep, apparently we've said no a couple of times to actually a, a negotiated withdrawal. So it seems to me that there is something to, there's, there's, a, 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 there's a lot of potential members of this um, Hey, nuclear war is an okay religion idea because people are saying, well, yeah, we can't have, um, we can't uh, placate him. We can't appease him. So let's just go ahead and have the world in because hmm. it's okay. Have you seen non-credible defense? Uh, it's, a, it's a subreddit. They, uh, they basically are a post-ironic, uh, they post-ironically advocate for like nuclear war with Russia, which is to say like, it sounds like they're joking, but they're not actually joking. Um, and uh, very bad, nuclear war bad, although it would solve climate change. Yeah, uh, it, um, and then we could have all the all the movies we love so much about post-apocalyptic stuff where dinosaurs come back and whatever come back. I mean, we could finally see if those come true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give, make someone disaffected enough. That sounds like a pretty good, uh, pretty good future. One of the videos, like the whole zombie, whatever. One of the videos I just finished is "Will we have a nuclear war?" and what would it be like? And I'm not going to spoil it, but I see the statistical chances of us having a nuclear war are pretty low in the near future. Um, but change the topic for a second. Greg, have you read the incel wiki? Oh yeah. That's the only source of literature I've ever read. <laughs> that's so like incel wiki is so fascinating because the incels have constructed this entire super complicated mythology where in, uh, you know, like for Dave, for incels established this hierarchy of different archetypes of where you are in the sexual hierarchy. So do you know Chad and incel? So, but it gets to a horrifically specific degree, and it's just amusing that it's it's the creation of what amounts to a new mythology, and it's it's remarkable that it's all homegrown and no one imagined it up to create it. But it's, it, I find it just really remarkable how much effort they put into that. 
The, the only thing I'll, uh, I'll add to that is uh, it's not clear if it's like how much of that is like incel, how much of that is pickup artist, manosphere type, because those yeah. there's overlap in that area, but they are kind of distinct groups at the same time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, sometimes this, the face you're looking at is the face of an older guy going, what? Yeah, I yeah, no, yeah. I'm going to explain this, Dave. Yeah, because about half, you know, this a lot of this is Greek to me, but okay. yeah, yeah, this is. This, I'm this, not going to go check it out. Esoteric language. Do you want to? Do you want to take yeah. this, Greg, or should I? Oh, and you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, um, incel. You know what an incel is? Not really. Oh, okay. I, I picked it up during this conversation. It's an involuntary celibate. It's a guy who wants to get laid but can't, and they're a political movement on. That's life. called guys. <laughs> <laughs> but the incels that's just incel yeah, philosophy that's, that's cis incel philosophy is that they're a uh, an oppressed social group and that they can't get laid they're like black people or women and that they are oppressed by society and um they this is because like the latest stat is 65 percent of men are single at least 30 percent haven't had sex since turn uh, of men under the age of 30 haven't had sex since turning age 18 so there's this large disgruntled demographic and what they do, the incels, is they constructed this whole mythological religious social structure with various memes around sexual relationships. So there's the incel or the virgin, which is who they are. Then there's the Chad, which is the guy who gets laid a lot. And they think Chads have it great. I know, I know many people you could call Chads. They hate their lives too. Then you have Beckys, which are... A Becky is a uh, unattractive kind of frumpy girl. A Stacy is a very attractive girl. And then they go so much further. So like it's it's really the, they go into an insane amount of hyper specificity where there's like 40 types, types of subtype of incel. And it's just it's remarkable because it's all an indigenous like homegrown internet culture. Huh. So it sounds like the good beginnings of an army though. Like most of yeah. your videos talk about having a bunch of males who don't have sex partners being really easily exactly. um, attracted to joining a militia or something. Incels are perfect revolution fodder. But that problem will solve itself in 15 years when we get the AIGF. Yeah, if you if you can make up your own girlfriend, Cherry 3000, that movie you guys probably don't remember, but if you can have your own robot girl um, who you program through ChatGPT, why worry about it yeah people are already falling in love with like the replica ai which is like this app you can get on your phone and they removed sexting uh recently and there was all these comments saying well nothing left to live for anymore you know <laughs> uh so yeah i mean it's closer than you think and then the good part about that is instead of these uh incel uprising people going onto the streets and doing bad things they just stay in their cube they'll stay in their cube even the and cube I'll be, ha be happier in their cube yeah they'll be they'll be in the cube and they'll be happy well, in Star Trek, there was the um, what was the room that you went into um, where holodeck? Uh, holodeck, yeah, and then people got holodiction. Mm, holodiction, right? that's a good word. Yeah, so you would you would stay in the holodeck all day long because why would you leave? It wow. could be whatever you wanted it to be. The um, mm. the I mean, to circle back to narco primitivists, it just reminds me of Kaczynski, where Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, said society of the next hundred years would either we would either be genetically engineered to become servile cube people. Or industrial civilization was doomed since it um, basically humans weren't evolved for it. We would all end up lonely. We wouldn't have kids. And thirty years later, it's that looks kind or, of or or everyone would read Kaczynski and suddenly to blow up all of the technology. You, you forgot what, that third option. Have you seen the all? Yeah, have you seen the? Yeah, you're right. Have you seen how Kaczynski has become such a big figure among young men? Like they call him Uncle Ted, and there's all these videos. Ooh, I mean, I'm gonna make a Kaczynski video, but it's. All these young men idolize Kaczynski and treat him like a saint. Yeah, I'd say it's young young uh, people in general who are dissatisfied with the yeah. screen life, looking at people well, 16 hours a day. With respect screen. to the earlier discussion about being reasonable, I mean, um, Joan of Arc is considered a good person. This is someone who at the time was considered extreme, an extremist, who took up arms, killed people, right? Almost all the great heroes of the time from Muhammad to whatever, right? You know, took up arms and, uh, I'm interested, you know. uh, I'm interested to hear your, your perspective on the, this, this stuff, uh, David, because I, I have older friends I talk to about this and they find the young people's interest in the Unabomber very, very disturbing because they know, they remember the crimes that he was committing and the damage that he did. I know. So yeah, what do, what do you think about that? Well, motivations are of interest to me as much as the outcome. So 
somebody did something horrific, what root cause, what caused that? And is that something that could re replicate? So um, uh, empathizing and understanding why somebody does what they do, this, that's actually something I'm pretty good at. Most people aren't. That's Most people don't score very high on the empathy scale, right? Doesn't mean sympathy. It just means, can you put yourself in somebody else's shoes, right? And um, this, you know, these things, patterns repeat. There are always some disaffected, angry, frustrated, stressed uh, person who then takes up arms and uh, out of frustration and does something horrific. Um, I'm mostly interested in it because of what caused that, et cetera. Yeah. And um, are we addressing any of those root causes? You know, what causes somebody to pick up a gun and shoot somebody in a school? And I won't get in that whole thing, but clearly this is a mental health issue. And what part does society play in it? What part does our current zeitgeist and experience and whatever, you know, what, what, what adds to that didn't used to happen so much. So what caused Kaczynski to evolve? How did he become Kaczynski? What made Hitler, Hitler, what made whoever, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's of interest to me. Um, the idea that somebody, um, emulates him is disturbing because not just cause it's horrific, but because there's something that drives that thinking that he resonates in some way with him. So they're clearly unhappy. If he, if, if you resonate, if you somehow admire Kaczynski, um, then there's something that you're really upset about. There's something that's driving you there. I admire all people who have the power of their convictions, people who do something as opposed to just talk about it. Right. So I, but, but, but then the, the cause, we have to argue about, do we agree with the cause or not? So anybody who has the power of their convictions. You know, I get some of my respect. If they blow people up, letter bomb or whatever, uh, you know, no. So, you know, I, I don't agree with that. But um, I have a great, you know, most people live quiet lives in desperation and don't do shit, right? So I would, uh, I, I, I think it's a balance of those two elements. I want, I, I like to be around and the people who actually do something and get something done. This is what attracted me to Rudyard. Rudyard, at the age of 13, decided to pick up a microphone and a camera and start doing something, right? And I don't care what that is, but he did something he had passion about it and he did that, right? Most people are lumps on the log, right? Okay. So in some ways, this will sound weird, like saying oh, you, you admire Kaczynski or you admire Joan of Arc or whomever. I mean, um, but yeah, I, I, I do that. Um, but I worry that we're going to have more and more Kaczynskis as we go through time because the dynamics is there. I mean, Hitler became Hitler because of his experience in World War One. So did Mussolini, right? One was an artist, one was a poet, et cetera. And they went through this hor horrific uh, experience and it twisted them. So something's twisting our people to want to be like Kaczynski. Yeah, I think I think you'd uh, you'd be surprised at how many like when there's a Unabomber meme posted, the top comments are always like me in five years. Uh, <laughs> uh, great. Semi jokingly. Uh, semi, but it's, it's post ironic. So it, it, it has the veil right. of a joke, explain, but it's explain curious. your five, six degrees of irony, please. This was a great. Thing. Uh, yeah. uh, you have a gradation scale. So we, so we can talk about a couple of different things. So I, obviously, if I'm talking about ironic stuff, I'm saying the opposite of what I mean. Uh, that's sarcasm. You know what that is. But like on the Internet, there's there's mainly like two other kinds of irony. Uh, post irony is what I was talking about with um, non-credible defense or the people like the Unabomber, where they actually do. Like, for example, if I say like, like, uh, oh, yeah, me in five years kind of seems like a joke because you're talking about the Unabomber. But I actually do. There's much. a little hint of truth to yeah, it. I, I basically mean what I'm saying. Like, I, I don't like the modern world. I want to go into the woods and blow people up. That's kind of what I'm saying. Um, but uh, then there's meta irony, which is like you can't tell if it's serious or not. And there's no way of knowing. And the person saying it doesn't even really know what they're saying. So if I'm like, uh, you know, if I'm watching the Unabomber thing and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go into the woods and I'm going to. I'm going to stalk the technocrats and I'm going to see where, you know, these technocrats live and blah, blah, blah. Um, you can't really tell. Like we can't tell if you're serious. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It's like, it's like, mm, are they serious? And sometimes the person saying it doesn't even know if they're serious or not. So that's, that's, that's basically, those are the two, those are the two main things that you'll see on the internet. I mean, you'll, you can, you can use the words to describe like um, a lot of different behavior and uh, it's, they're not very good terms but like yeah the ambiguous irony and like sincere sounding irony but it's like actually uh, it's actually so i used to make jokes with my mom all the time and she thought i was serious i would be trying to be ironic or sar sarcastic you know and and speak in hyperbolic terms say you know whatever and that she was like don't do that i go mom i'm not serious 
So um, yeah, but but then but then the the the, the post irony is you're like unless unless um, and then I you like, do it. I like your post post irony, which is you don't even know what you're saying and you're just randomly throwing words out to figure out how the other person responds. So yeah, that, that's called a seizure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're trying stuff. You're throwing stuff up against the wall. It's called a psychotic. Yeah, I used break. to say that uh, people are lucky. I don't end up naked in a in a high in a tower with a high powered rifle. Hmm. And which of those? Where does that fit in your uh, hierarchy of? Uh, of, of I, I, hierarchy? The thing is, it's it's hard to it's hard to tell. I mean, you have to know the the context of what the person was saying, and you know, would they? Actually, I'm serious. People are lucky. I haven't ended up in a yeah, tower with a exactly yeah high powered rifle. Um, guys, how long do you want this one to be? Like uh, one, two, yeah, I, I think we're probably good here. Um, I want to say this is great, and it's the kind of thing I think we want to do. We started off explain what this is about, yeah. and um, and that's great. But most importantly, we want to have a guest like Greg come and share what he thinks and ask him a few questions and riff on that. So this was great. I want to, yeah, I want to say thanks, and this is what I'd like to see us do in the future. Yeah, I think this went well. Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. Uh, I know I'm probably I'm probably a difficult first guest because I'm. I'm always operating on uh, some some amount of uh, irony well, here. But. You set you set you set the bar now, okay? Mm -hmm. And you set the standard that we can we can be all over the map. We can have nuanced conversations. We can talk about stuff the other person doesn't know about. It doesn't have to be scripted. I like all of those things because that makes things interesting. Also, I've known you for a while, Greg, so I kind of know how to communicate with you in a way that doesn't like that wouldn't drive me or the audience nuts. <laughs> okay. Well, very good. Uh, you'll probably run into more structured, structured thinkers in the future. But uh, yeah, this was good, good stuff. Thanks yeah, for having me. This was great. We really appreciate. It. I appreciate it very yeah. much. It was great meeting you, and I'm gonna be watching the rest of your videos now. Yeah. Okay. Well, great to meet you, David, as well. And uh, thanks for having me. What sure. if alt hist? Alrighty. Thank you for, uh, doing this all and take care. Okay. Sure. Bye, everyone. Bye.